Welcome to another episode of Life in Bali. I'm DC uh, Puba of Duke Audio and Cuke Archives, coming to you from Sleepy Sanur. I'm here with Doggett Bandita and Feline Cuchita, but without Dearest Katrinka, who we hope to see soon. I pray that you and yours are safe and comfortable and uh, able to get out and do whatever you want within the limitations of the universal precept of do as little harm as possible. And uh, Life in Bali uh, is our Thursday podcast where we basically do material outside of Duke Archives. It's the Nonsense uh, podcast. So today we're going to have uh, Sustainable Susie at 13 minutes and 10 seconds. But I'm going to go on about some other um, items first. And after Sustainable Susie, there will be a song called Offerings. Persimbahan, Persimbahan, in Indonesian and English. The uh, COVID-19 virus situation has gotten more serious in Bali after a long period of um, very little increase. Uh, Now there are 1,080 positive cases known in Bali uh, as of today, um, the 23rd of June here. Uh, 615 of them are reported to have recovered and nine deaths. What I'm reading uh, on Facebook, there's a woman who keeps up with it and posts on Facebook, Bali COVID-19 update. Uh, And um, uh, they're taking it really seriously. And, and, you know, when when somebody tests positive in a market or somewhere, they go in and and test everybody. Uh, And it's the markets, uh, mainly the night markets, uh, where it's spreading, and much more with uh, people who are gathering together in places like that, of course. So uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, Katrinka's trying to come back in the middle of uh, July, uh, having been in America over three months now. So uh, we'll see how that works. It looks like she'd have to fly into Jakarta and then get from there to here. There aren't any flights, uh, international flights coming into Bali. Haven't been for a while. Heck, I don't hear any flights. Uh, you can't get in here that easy. I mean, we we live pretty near the airport. I very seldom hear anything. I mean, there's got to be cargo coming in and out. Not all the planes fly where I can hear them, but some do. But I just don't remember hearing it at all recently. And there aren't any, or maybe there's a few international flights she could have come in on, but uh, they'd be awful expensive uh, coming into Jakarta. Uh, so she's looking at July 15th as a time when she can even get there. Uh, and, and we'll see how that goes. So we got a, a wind chime. Oh, I don't know. I got it a couple of weeks ago to replace one that had just rotted uh, and actually fell out of the tree and I put it in the backyard. And... Um, I can uh, 
I can uh, stop it from making noise by getting on a ladder. It, it's got this little circular wooden thing in the middle that hits the pieces of bamboo. And uh, I can pull it to the outside of the bamboo pieces, and then it won't make noise. But I only do that if I'm reading a chapter from Crooked Cucumber. Uh, otherwise, I just leave it there. And so you might hear a little wind chime sound now and then coming through. There's not a real strong wind now, so I don't think you will. But you know, the main sound here is motorcycles. <laughs> it's not too bad here because we're on a side street. <laughs> Actually, they're motor scooters. There, there's a lot more motor scooters than motorcycles. Uh, and But, you know, pretty formidable motor scooters. But one sound I really love and that we haven't had much of recently is, uh, I don't know what to call it. Uh, but let me tell you when I first heard it. And when I, I first noticed it, I was doing a walking meditation at uh, Brahma Vihara Rama, the Buddhist temple up north. And, uh, it, it, you know, doing walking meditation outside. You know, I was in a retreat, so I was doing, oh, I don't know, about eight hours of it in a day. I mean, it was really an hour of walking, an hour of sitting. Uh, really, it just went on and on and on. You forget about time. But I'd hear this eerie sound sometimes. And it was sort of like old... I thought, what does that sound like? I thought, it sounds like old 1950s flying saucer sounds from sci-fi movies back then. You know, sort of eerie, sort of really weird. It's sort of almost like if, if you know anything about recording or anything or, or sound enhancement for uh, musical instruments like electric guitars, sounds a little sometimes like a, a flangey type sound, which can be sort of eerie, a sort of thin metallic sort of warbling, uh, changing sound. Uh, oh, a, a little like a theremin. So I wondered what it was. And I, you know, since it was happening while I was meditating and we didn't talk, I, I never asked anybody. But then... When I got back, I noticed I'd hear it every once in a while here, in particular places at particular times. Not a lot. When I say here, I just mean in Sonora, where we used to live. But then when we moved here to this house, I would hear it quite a bit, like once or twice a day. And then I noticed it was birds. It was all these pigeons, like a whole flock of pigeons would fly around. So this time it was like really near me. And I went, wow. You know, I've mentioned the Colonial House, which is just a few minutes away. Uh, and I was walking by there one day. And I, I, I went, there, you know, there's sort of a, a, a guest entrance and a and a service entrance, and it's got bigger doors, so, you know, a truck can back in. So I well, I saw some people in there, and, you know, I, I knew them to say hello when I walked by. And I said, hey, I got a question for you. I said, there used to be this eerie sound, that would, and I, I haven't heard it recently, uh, you know, and I described it, and this and that. I said, it was hard to describe. Oh, I said, I, I think it's involved with the birds, with the pigeons. And what's that? And he said, yeah, that was our pigeons. I said, well, what? what is it? And he said, uh, well, we tie a ring around a foot, around the ankle, and it makes that sound. And we, you know, they put a, a ring, there's a special type of ring. Oh, I said, well, what happened to the birds? He said, oh, 
I, I sold them all. They were just his. Uh, or maybe his family's. Uh, but so I've seen them, I've heard them, <laughs> I've seen them. Well, now I, I will see them uh, or hear them now and then. Uh, but, um, you know, for a long time there haven't been any. I And I sort of got, that sometimes they can be a little bit creepy. <laughs> but then I, it got to be where I really liked it because it was only like, you know, for an hour or something. And, and it was sort of dreamy or something. But now, recently, I've been hearing it, but they're more distant. And uh, I don't hear it. You know, I just hear it now and then. And when I hear it, I sort of like it. Again, I think it's sort of dreamy. I don't know what to call it. I tried to Google it, but um, different types of ring and birds and stuff would come up. Uh, so, hey, if anybody knows exactly what that is, of course, I could just go back and ask them at the Colonial House uh, to tell me, you know, what it is in Indonesian. And uh, then I could probably figure it out that way. Okay. So that's the, <laughs> that was today's report of Sounds in Bali. Well, we're going to talk now with um, Susie Hutomo. She's a neighbor. She used to be a closer neighbor, but she lives with her husband, Utomo, here in Sonur. And um, I really don't have to give her uh, much of an introduction because all the information comes out in the phone chat with her. She's uh, known uh, publicly as Sustainable Susie. So let's just uh, take it away now with the phone chat with Sustainable Susie. Hello, David. Hi, Susie. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Uh, is this good? I'm ready. Yeah, this is a good time. Good. Yes. Why don't you just tell us your story and who you are? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're Susie Como, <laughs> sustainable Susie. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. As, okay, I'll, I'll just kind of... I am um, a mother of three, and I moved to Bali about eight years ago. From where? So it's been eight years now. My, from Jakarta uh -huh. with my uh, my husband and my three children. Mm -hmm. And um, but my husband and I have a business, which is the body shop uh, franchise for Indonesia. Yes. And so um, I've always been sort of a nature lover, you know, loving wildlife and conservation, watching David Attenborough. That was my childhood. Mm -hmm. I did uh, go to school overseas. I did, uh, you know, until I was in college in where, Singapore where? and later on New York City. Where? Uh, in Singapore at the National University. Uh -huh. And then later on in New York City. Uh, it was a long time ago, 1992. Where? <laughs> 82, sorry. Not what? even nice. In New York City at the Fashion Institute of Technology. Hmm. Hmm. That was a long time ago, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So then um, my husband and I uh, wanted to have a business. So then because I, I didn't really like um, being in the commercial type of business, so we got introduced to the body shop. Mm -hmm. And they were very keen to find somebody who would have the same values as, as the body shop had. Mm. And so very quickly, in fact, it happened quite quickly, uh, we were given the franchise. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, they even came to, they sent a director um, who came, you know, in a little safari suit and then asked me, you Susie, you Tomo? Okay, so uh, let's go to the zoo. Because I wanted to see um, a Sumatran rhino who's pregnant. We're like, oh, okay. <laughs> mm. So this director and us, we had a lot of conversations about the planet and the sustainability, which was not called sustainability at that time, obviously. And yes. we were at the Zucata Zoo. And then after that, then we, we went into uh, more of a business discussion. So I think it was very important um, for the body shop that, People who had the franchise in those days, I must say, this was in 19, um, what was it? Yeah, 1991, I think. Oh 1991. It was important. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so it's very important to have people who were like-minded. So that's how we started. I mean, I was already sort of an environmentalist and my mother used to have an organic farm. So it's all kind of in the family kind of mm. thing. And then, so it kind of progress from there and and um now the body shop quite a big yeah reasonably big company in indonesia and we are one of the uh most developed in terms of recycling and and all these uh, environmental management so uh, when i moved to bali i decided that i would have my own how to say my own space if you will to talk about the environment yeah. not just through the body shop so that's why I have this sustainable Susie. Uh -huh. um, I was keen to have a house that was uh, as green as possible. And I figured if I could afford it and I didn't invest, how could I expect anybody else to? So I put in lots of solar panels. Now I have more than 100. I'm already on my third installation. And then um, I've got recycled gray water recycling. I have uh, quite a lot of composting. I've worked with Eco Bali. And mm. also a bank sampah nearby. And then um, what else do we do? Yeah, uh, a lot of recycled stuff. And under Sustainable Susie, I've been producing a lot of um, videos, short videos, just, just to be, just to sort of uh, give people an option to look at something that's not about commercialism and sort of, you know, uh, how to say all these beautiful lifestyle pictures. But about sort of um, eco living that you can actually follow or you, you can see at least it's happening, you know, so, so I share. And then what happened was people started asking me, where do you buy this? Where do you buy that? So then I had a little, I, I still have a little Tokopedia account sort of uh, selling like, you know, things that people want to buy from me, you know. So, you know, this is not the body shop. This is just me doing small business, you know, just selling stuff that people wanted. Because mm -hmm. I kept sending them to other places, but they said, oh, it doesn't work. The link doesn't work or whatever. So anyway, so I have that little shop as well. And I am writing a book uh, about Bali and sustainability or what I, it's a personal experience about uh, how I, I sort of have experienced um, sustainability in Bali and that. Might take another, I don't know, nine months maybe. <laughs> uh huh. Uh -huh. Very so good. That, yeah. So that's really that's really it in a nutshell. Ooh, that's really really interesting. You know, I I learned about you from your husband. Uh, that's right. You met him, yes. <laughs> at Batu Chimbar, that uh, was so full that we shared a table uh, for a while. I see. And. And he's very yep. proud of you. <laughs> he told me all about you. <laughs> and that's why I got Thank hold you. of you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I do, uh, I live over in the, Mer I know where you live. Uh, and uh, okay. I, I, I used to live uh, over on uh, Jalan Wira, you know, the little back road to the Bali Hyatt Hotel. Just oh, right, okay. right mm -hmm. near you for three years with my wife. Uh, who likes to go to the body shop. <laughs> okay, that's cool. <laughs> she doesn't very often, but uh, when she sees one, she's the body shop and shoe stores, and I try to keep her away from, but uh, she... <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, uh, I do... Uh, I live over in the Murtisari area, and... Uh, okay. You know, we have a, a house with, uh, you know, a courtyard and a garden and stuff. And, and I do, I've yeah, always fantastic. done composting. I, I do composting, I fantastic. do recycling. Uh -huh. And I just, uh, I just use the pumalung, you know, the 
the guys who go up and down the street with their uh, with their motor scooters. Mm. And uh, yeah, every once in a while, uh, I have this bemo driver in Yoman. We'll 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 load a whole uh, bemo up with uh, recyclables I've collected and go to some of the big uh, recycling areas, the big Pumalung areas. Uh, That's great. Yeah. yeah. And um, so, uh, so you know, I'm, I'm an old recycler. I, I started uh, the first full-time recycling center in San Francisco many years ago. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it was okay. small. It was small. And there were there yeah. were much bigger operations, but they weren't, you know, full-time. And that was back in the days where, it, like now, where people had to, like now here, where people had to bring it to you. Uh, it's like yeah. the first step uh, before right. um, before there was a home. Before pickup. the municipal will do it. Yeah, that's right. And I, I've, I'm also familiar with uh, Tepea and uh, with the, uh, yes. the, the, the uh, problems there. <laughs> uh, the, the, the people who uh, are doing um, uh, composting, uh, Oh, the uh, I know which one you mean. The one that has the big uh, composting facility. Right, right. Got the name, sir. And, and yeah, uh, yeah. There's there's uh, two right now. I forget the names. There's there's two there. There's these two fellows that do composting around here. They do it with the university in uh, Uluwatu. Oh, see, I didn't know that. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, well, uh huh. One's from. One is from uh, from uh, very near where I, I'm from in California. Well, I'm not from California originally. He's from Big Sur, very small, famous community. And uh, great. Uh-huh. Uh, and and uh, anyway, I've been there and and seen the the composting they're doing. They they treat they do in one year the equivalent of what comes into the Tepea every day. And yeah, uh, the, wow. it's really uh, horrible the way uh, plastic is wi- mixed with organic waste here. I know. Um, and yeah, uh, exactly. the landfill problem is terrible. Incidentally, it's terrible worldwide. It's a bad problem in America and everywhere. Recycling mm. is, is uh, uh, not doing well. What, what's your take on no. I on know. recycling and composting in terms of Bali and Indonesia now? Yeah, I think that there is, as you point out, we have the Pamulung, we have like, a, how do you say this, this sort of um, informal uh, people who are taking recyclables. But the problem is that we don't separate the trash, and that's the biggest, biggest problem. And the, you know, the people that the LHK who comes to pick up the trash, they don't care either. So it's really, I know in Murtasari, though, you have the, uh, depo, apa ya, not Chamara, what's the other name? You have a uh, TPS 3R, I think, who is now uh, asking um, uh, residents to separate. I think it's being supported by um, some NGO to to. Uh, make a trial for asking residents to separate their trash. I'm not sure if you're one of them or not. Oh, uh, well, no, I just I just do a little home stuff, and I've done it for a few neighbors. Uh, yeah, I wonder if they collect. So I guess they're not collecting anything from you. But I know there is a project there. I can't remember the name, but they're trying it. And uh, when I saw them come to pick up the, the waste from my daughter's house, because my daughter lives in Matasari, and we separate, you know, she separates the trash and then they collect it. It seems to be working, but this is not enough energy. So what I'd say is that there are projects like what you pointed out, like uh, these are the guy who's having the composting. There's sort of quite a lot of um, people like us, I guess, who, who care and who would like to start things. Unfortunately, we don't have a, a strong you know, how do you say, policy and that. Actually, the governor, as you know, has issued a decree that everyone should take care of their own waste. He's just saying, yeah. this is a problem, and all of you, you put the, all the data, all the budget, you got to sort out your own waste. But <laughs> that isn't a solution either, because they start burning the plastic, right? That's another big problem. So 
What I'd like to say is there's a lot of interest, quite a lot of energy. I know that I has had so many proposals on doing this whole methane capture and so on, but I don't know, there has never been a good proposal because, I mean, I've been to these seminars about incinerators and how bad they are because right. they really right. want you to produce more and more plastic so that it can burn, you know, so yeah. it, it's the wrong solution as well. So anyway, yeah. I don't think we have the silver bullet and I don't think yeah. um, we have enough of a policy or or a framework at the Pemprof level, actually. I don't think so. So it's really right. now just people like us, really. Right, right. Oh, know, oh, and Info Bali, a few good companies. Uh huh. Yeah, uh, the 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 name of the I remember the name of the recyclers for Bali Compost Crafters, the one. That oh, okay. Is uh, okay. Uh, Oliver, and um, what's his name? Uh, Robert. Robert's from Big Sur. Oh, is it Oliver Puilon? No, not? no, that's. That's the other Oliver. The, There's two Olivers right. <laughs> in two. And I it's, see. Okay. It's very funny because I met Oliver uh, Malger. I think he might be from Holland, okay. but he lives in Australia and here. And that, they've been doing this like 12, 13 years here. Uh, and they uh -huh. have a big deal going on at the university in Uluwatu. And the university is very supportive of giving, giving them land to do it. But ah, oh, in itu ya, apa at, Udayana maybe? Uh, yeah, U Udayana, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. And uh, that's so, great. I'd love to be connected. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. That, uh, you should know them. Uh, and now I haven't been in touch with them in a couple of years, so I want to make sure they're still doing it because I mean it was a lot of work, and I'm sure. And you know they're really going against the grain, but the other Oliver. Olivier is ah uh, yes Olivier yeah he's from France but he grew up in That's Washington right. D.C. so he seems like he's from the ah. East Coast in the United States very okay. very much like an East Coast American and his his operation's much bigger he's been doing it since '95 what's it called maybe you know I it's, forgot yeah it's the big one bang yeah. something uh Simalu now is it I think now he's got like an app. No, that you can call like your your pick, you know, you'll pick up waste and stuff as well. Uh, no, he does more like uh, cities and stuff. He does it on a big scale. Um, he might, mm -hmm. he might, he might do that too. I shouldn't speak for him. I don't know what's happening there. Uh, and he started right. Gringo. That's know? right, Gringo. Yeah. Yeah. That's their their foundation or something, and that that had a. A little office here at uh, Ruma Sanur. But I, I spent a day with uh, both Olivier's. I didn't know about the second one. Uh, Oliver asked me to meet him at the Tepe A. And, you know, uh, I, I couldn't figure out where I was supposed to meet him. So I went into the office, and they don't even want you to be there. And, and then uh, oh. the guy asked me, well, who are you looking for? And I said, Oliver. And he said, oh, he's sitting right over there. Oh, oh no! Go right <laughs> over there. He's going to. He's going to come. He's not sitting there. He's going to come right over there. So I went and sat there, and this other guy comes up, and um, uh, he says, "Anyway, I think we're waiting for Oliver to come here." That was Olivier, <laughs> and the Oliver was waiting for me somewhere else, and I thought I was. I'd just been told that Oliver was coming here and I was sitting by him and finally the three of us got together and listening to them <laughs> talking about doing recycling here is was extremely discouraging. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. like, it's like uh, Guyanyar had stopped uh, their landfill. They would closed their landfill. Yeah. Where it had to come here to the Tepea, which is overfill. And so many That's things. That's why I had a fire. Uh huh. That's right. Uh, and you know, the, the, one of the big problems is not not composting or or not re-entering into the earth the the organic That's the right. enormous amount of organic uh, waste. Exactly. And, and mixing it exactly. with, with uh, plastic. Exactly. Yeah. They said that twenty-five different companies had looked at the landfill here to see if it, you know, 
international companies to see if maybe they could uh, mine it, you know, and they all turned it down. Mm -hmm. It was too, you know, they don't, the only thing they can come up with, uh, the thing, the government, they were saying then is wanting to incinerate it, to burn it. And like, That's what I heard, but it's a bad idea as well. So. It is. It creates yeah. dioxin and other things. Yeah. Uh, so, but now they're, they're, how do you say, the, the part near the um, the road, as you can see, is being, how do you say, they put a layer of, um, how do you say, topsoil on it? It's sealed. Yeah. But the tepe inside is still, you know, it's still operating. I mean, we still have a huge amount of trucks going in with all the organic material, which, like you, I don't understand why that is, but, you know. Well. You know, I've, I've even spoken to the, the El Haka that picks up waste in front of, in the road in front of my house, and I asked them, so, these are, because they have, like, the, the different colored things, right? And I said, so, how are you separating? Oh, we just put them all in together. That's right. <laughs> That's right. They take the... <laughs> They have the waste containers all separated, then they come pick it up and throw it in together. Uh, exactly. But, and then, of course, there's a lot of people who go through it then. So there's a lot a lot of uh, the recyclables are right, then right. taken out, but not systematically. Right. And also, the village next to the dump, the Tepea, at, they were going to destroy it to and move all those people away to have more landfill. I don't know, that might have already happened. Oh. Um so well, all right, so we 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 agree it's discouraging. I, I, before I right. ask you the next question, I want to tell you one other thing that's discouraging is that mm -hmm. what what our Olivers had experienced was that local Officials, not all of them, not the ones at the highest. He thought they thought were were really sincerely interested, but it, the uh, some of them would they would just want to get a grant in order to get some money. So they just want to show they were doing something. And they really yeah. weren't interested in solving the overall problem. Uh, yeah. So this is a. Um, uh, I have to say, yeah, this is a very Indonesian, very local perspective, and I know it well because I'm Indonesian. So they, um, uh, sampah, even the term sampah is like not just wage, it's garbage, you know. Uh -huh. So this whole, uh, I have to say, how to turn the mind from from sampah, which is garbage, to something that is uh, something you produce that affects your health, that affects the planet. It yeah. just hasn't sunk in. So it's all just project, you know, around Indonesia bilang project means, okay, it's a project, money for all of us. Some bullet is going to give us money to do something, you know, stuff like that. They don't really understand. They're not passionate about it. Because yeah. the whole understanding, uh, the, the change in the, how do you say, the conventional wisdom or whatever, it's not there. And they don't understand dioxin. It's in, no problem. Banyak dikumpulin aja bu, dibakar. That's it. You know, what's the big deal? Don't yeah. talk to me about all this stuff. Wrap up. You yeah. know, it's just bloody wrap up. And I just have to put it all together in the pile and just burn it. It's gone. What's wrong? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, this is really difficult. It really takes, I think, that's why I've, I've been struggling with because I live on the other end of San Norris, you know, and I've approached uh, the Yayasan uh, Pembangunan San Nur to do a project here with the hotel. To at least clean up the beach. Let's just keep the beach clean for the tourists. At least that. And then we can start from there. But nobody's willing to pay any money. That's the problem. Then the Denpasar is not willing. So there's yeah. no funds. Yeah. So um, in the end, back to the drawing board. <laughs> well, say in 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 Sunur, I, I've seen a lot of, you know, uh, the beach cleanup being done by... Yep. Uh, by you know, people Volunteers, out there yep. with shovels, then they bury it in the sand. Yes, those are the the people who are being paid by the city. Those are the ones in the uniform. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> or the ones who work for the hotel. I know as well. I see the same thing. Yeah, not always. <laughs> in, in front of the Mercure here, uh, they pick yeah. it up in carts, but they don't do it always. Uh, and yeah, it depends on, yeah, I know. It, that that well, 
you know, plastic in the ocean is such a big problem. It's a bigger problem it's a over in Kuta. Huge problem. You, you know, Kuta yeah, and that's S- a bigger have a horrible problem. Yeah, because on the West Coast, uh, they have the currents there. So that's a much bigger problem. We we are on the east, so we're a little bit better off. But during, I think it was recently, it was like May or April, we had the waste coming, uh, washing up. And, and the idea is people always think it's somebody else's waste. And, the, and it means that, oh, it doesn't come from Bali, it comes from heaven knows what. I know. But actually, that's not always I know. true. I know. Mm. I know. I hear that so often. Oh, it comes from Java and other exactly. islands. Well, maybe some of it does, uh, but... Yeah, some of it does, yeah. Oh. But not all of it. <laughs> Olivia showed me a picture of uh, of uh, just dump trucks coming in and filling creek beds up in uh, Guyana. Exactly. Because uh, yes. they closed the landfill. I mean, uh, a lot of them, they don't want to come all the way down here. No, uh, no, uh, yeah. And you'll talk to them and they'll say... Uh, They'll say, oh, it's dry. It doesn't matter, you know. But he said, well, it's dry now. <laughs> you know, but it won't be later. And and uh, you know right. what Forest Island is? Myrta what Ades. island, sorry? Forest Island, Myrta Ada's uh, no. meditation retreat. Uh, no. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, it's it's in Tabanan. And I've done okay. re- retreats there, Bali Usada. And, um, oh, yeah, Bali Usada, I know. Uh-huh. Yeah. And uh, Forest Islands, they're a very, very nice retreat center. Uh, and um, so, uh, you know, there, there's a, a creek. There are two creeks. There's a creek on each side, uh, a very deep gorges. And, uh, right. you know, there's plastic trash in it from the village. I so I've, I've talked to the, to the man who runs it. <laughs> uh, why don't why don't we talk to the people in the village? He said, they don't want to hear from right. us. Like, we're city people. They, they were exactly. city That's people I mean. telling them what to do. They've always thrown their trash in the creek. Uh, exactly. That's what I mean. It, you need a totally uh, local approach, and there has to be a solution for everybody. That's what I found, because I've been talking to the locals because, you know, I'm Indonesian. So the thing is, they don't want to pay anything for garbage disposal. That is a major problem. Because there's no pickup service. Yeah. And when there's pickup service, you have to pay. And that is a major issue they don't want to pay. In fact, there was a study in Tabanan yeah. um, that where the Japanese agency provided pickup service for a whole year, and people had to separate their trash. And they did it because it was free. And then after that, everybody had to pay 10000 per month per household. It's nothing, you know, 10000 and they wouldn't do it. So there was no more pickup service. It's 70,000 mm. here. Yeah. 70,000 so, a month. You know, yeah, so that's the problem, really. There has to be a way in which the community can act. Because in Bali, it's more community. We're not like in a big city, you know, where the municipal is like plays a big role. Yeah. Here, the, what I think, I personally believe there has to be a desa-type solution. Like there must be a bangtampa there must be some kind of uh, incinerator or small scale something to process the plastic in some way. If not incinerator, there has to be eco brick, but eco brick takes forever, so that's not a great solution. Because you know, you the problem is also the the amount of uh, plastic packaging that is produced by the consumerist uh, society, and and you know what, you cannot go away from it because this is the way that people believe they're improving their lives. So you can. I mean, I tried it. I tried well, talking to people about sachets, uh-huh. about bottles. I mean, body shop, we take them back and everything. No, no, no. Gabisa. Because this is the way they understand their life is improving. And you can't take that away from them either. Yeah. <sighs> so well said. Well you said. really need bang sampa and some kind of solution at the desa level, in my opinion. You cannot expect this whole municipal thing. It's just, it's not right for Bali and also for pedesaan, you know. For the village, it just doesn't work. Because otherwise, they just say, what's the big deal? Just dump it in the river. Or else I tell them, look, if you don't pay 10000 just to pick up your trash, how are you going to get rid of that? Oh, it's easy. Whenever it's very high, we decide whether we can ask some guy, pay him 20000 to dump in the uh, river, or we just kumpul in and we just uh, burn it. <laughs> uh, yeah. So what's wrong, yeah. you know, for them, it's such a simple solution. Don't bother me, you know. Yeah, <sighs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. So well, I, been... I, yeah, I get it from that point of view. You know, I, I get it from that point of view. I, I, you know, I'm busy. I have to make money. I got little kids. I got to cook, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Unless yeah. the Banjar is leading the effort and there's a total solution where everybody participates. It's like a Banjar project. You know, it, it, it doesn't work. So I, I'm the, the next thing I want to do is just go to talk with my Banjar next. Yeah. To say, look. Can we start something together? Because if you have some helicopter kind of project, it doesn't work. Not for villages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now, now I have heard from Robert, uh, uh, who works with Olivier and Campos Grafters, that the situation mm -hmm. is much better in Java. Uh, the, a a yeah, lot maybe, of the huh? rivers are cleaner. I mean, there's there there is some there are. Uh, positive movements. He said every bridge over there now has a sign, uh, you know, not to dump. Maybe not every bridge in Java, but a lot of yeah, places. Yeah, but they are no more dumping. aware of it. Yeah. And um, and also, you know, there there's uh, definitely a, a reduction in the use of plastic bags here. Uh, yes, definitely. That's a big, huge uh, improvement. Yes. Um, seems to me like like uh, we just have to get away from making packaging out of uh, fossil fuels and make packaging that's really compostable. But, you know, there's a problem with um, compostable plastic is it screws up plastic recycling. That's right. It does. And they also need 70 degrees to decompose, I think. Yeah. So um, just, unless, unless you just leave them, you know, in sunlight, then they'll obviously decompose in a year. Otherwise... Uh, I believe they don't just immediately, you know, what I heard is you need some kind of, uh, how to say, some kind of light heat or something. If they're hidden in the ground beneath all the, I mean, hidden in the pile beneath everything, they're not going to decompose. Yeah, no, no. If they don't uh, have stuff. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the stuff they say is compostable plastic is, um, uh, it, 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 it would be better if everything was like that than what we have, but it's it, yeah, uh, not so good, really. Uh, so, yeah. um, so we agree right. that we, we have many big problems. But, you know, uh, we didn't even talk about climate change. And that's a much bigger problem <laughs> than the plastic yeah. problem. Because the plastic exactly. problem I was is a... just, it's poisoning us. Yeah. We're poisoning the world with plastic very seriously. But yes. it won't, we can recover from it. It won't destroy the biosphere. But, but climate change... Uh, very possibly, I mean, it, we're we're losing uh, that battle for yeah, sure. We are losing the battle. Mm -hmm. a and uh, so, so uh, what do you think about that? <laughs> well, well, yeah, I am a climate change activist. I'm one of those uh, climate presenters. Uh, you know, I, I joined uh, Al, Go Al Gore's uh, climate reality group. Oh, wonderful! So that's one of yeah, that's one of the first things I did doing. Uh, started to talk about climate change to groups of people. And people, when they hear it, when they, you know, look around, I mean, I started about 10 years ago, but but um, people just don't know what to do about it because it's such a, how do you say? It's a, it's a public goods problem, you know what I mean? It has yeah. to, it, it, you know, it's not like, like plastic. You stop uh, throwing away plastic, then there's less plastic. But in, in climate change, it's a system thing. Yeah. And the biggest problem, in my opinion, is the fossil fuels. And that's why, I, as you know, I'm part of Greenpeace as well. So yeah. the, the upper namanya, the, the, how do you say, the generator, the, the electric, what do you call it, upper bangkit, uh, what do you call it, electrical generators, the big ones, the, in, in North Bali, right? You know we have one. Oh, North yeah, Bali. just the power plants. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, the power plants. And they just extended it, you know, it's just, you know, so. <sighs> but then the governor has vowed to put in more green uh, policy, you know, in terms of energy. He's, he's quite keen. I actually met him once, uh, just that one time. And he said, oh, no, I, I'm really committed to uh, a green valley, he said. So I was like, oh, that's great. Well, of course, having said that, of course, we need to see how that translates. But, right. but um, I think they are trying to push for 100% gas. And that's that taking a while for PLM. They have to build the, the port or whatever, this kind of piping and stuff. So I don't know when that will happen. But they, he has declared that uh, there will be cleaner fuel. That's one thing. Yeah. But the next stage would be to go into uh, 
renewables. But I think there is a regulation now that all new buildings, especially public and commercial, I don't know, I can't remember, 20% or 30% of the rooftop has to be uh, solar. Is that right? Is that right? Yeah, there is. A, I, I'm not sure if it's been passed or it's in process, but there is one. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Green Peace was part of that process, I remember. Yeah. Um, well, Diana also part of that. There is a climate change, uh, something like that there. Then, then people have to follow, follow it. I've seen, um, like, you know, there's a big hotel built on Tumbling and that Swiss thing, and, and it was... It yeah. was completely illegal, right? And so the, yeah. the, the whoever, the police or the head government people went there and they said, well, nothing I can do. All their papers were in order. <laughs> um, and um, uh, so, uh, you know, they, they, they can make, they can make uh, laws and regulations, but then they, there has to be teeth. They have to enforce exactly. it. And that's hard to yeah. do. Um, that's hard. I think in Indonesia, you, you can never hope for 100% enforcement. But if the trend is positive, because there are also people like us who will say, well, if that's a regulation, just do it. I mean, I don't want to have to, you know, bribe somebody and deal with all of that, you know. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, I think I think at least 30 to 40 percent of business people will say, look, let's just follow the regulations. It's just much simpler, you know, on, yeah, on top of yeah. it being the right thing. But it's just simpler. You know, I mean, doing all this stuff is not easy. I mean, even for Indonesians, it's tiring. And, you know, you become a little up and they always ask you for money because they grant you a favor. Right. So yes. not all of us like it, honestly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, you sound very realistic. Uh <laughs> So, I mean, it's, it's, uh, what I'm always hoping is that this is going to be more in the right direction. I don't know if it's always going to be as much as we want. That's, that's how I think anyway. Mm. <laughs> being yeah. Indonesian and being a realistic. <laughs> well, my understanding is, like, you saw that movie Trashed? Uh, no, I haven't seen that, actually. Oh, that's really great. Um, okay. Uh, the Sukarno uh, daughter, the one who's part Japanese, I think, uh, showed oh, it. Oh yeah. mm-hmm. Showed it to uh, uh, Jokowi, and that uh-huh. was that was like Good. five five years ago, five six years ago. Uh, she uh-huh. showed that to him, and um, uh, I, I know that uh, Jokowi, you know, the president of Indonesia, has to yeah. be yeah. aware of of the extreme threat of uh, climate change and the, the, the poisoning of, of, of our environment in so many ways. Uh, what, what is he able to do in your estimation and, and what um, is he doing? Well, if you look at the seriousness of the uh, environmental ministry, especially yeah. the division on trash, actually they're serious as much as they can be, you know, as a government department. Yeah. But definitely there is seriousness there. Uh, they're already sort of recognizing companies who deal with their own uh, waste, you know, like like, like us, we got we were the first ones because we take back all our trash, all our, our plastic packaging, everything. We take it back and we deal with it. And there are others, I think. And then so... So they are starting to pass more regulations. On the on the uh, waste issue, a very big factor is the fact that waste uh, legally in the, how do you say, in the government's regulations is defined as a local, how do you say, jurisdiction. Yeah. So that means that the center cannot uh, pass a countrywide sort of policy, if you will, Every governor and every apa, ketua kabupaten, they have to pass regency. their own. Uh, yeah, the regencies have to pass their own regulations. Yeah. And because of this, and one of the problems, like Pak Luhut, as you know, is the coordinating minister. He was given the task to reduce ocean waste, right? Because yeah. of the uh, uh-huh. commitment that Indonesia has made. So yeah. we actually, uh, me and Malati Weissen actually went to see the... Um, his uh, his assistant on waste, and what they said was what he said was what their study found was that the kabupaten, which is the regency level, and the 
uh, particularly the regency level, has not allowed enough funds in their budgeting for waste management. And therefore, yeah. you cannot implement it where there's not enough money to pick up the trash and to sort it and whatever. So yeah. that was the biggest battle that they had to, to face, to put all the regions together, to tell them to budget properly. So that was the process they were doing last year. Yeah. I, haven't, I, haven't, yeah, I don't know what the process is now, but there is more and more attention. That's also part of the reason why, for instance, Java, some parts are already better because they are required to budget enough. But at least if they have the facilities already, but they just don't have budget enough, then it's okay. Because don't forget, in Java, they have many more bank sampah and TPS 3R and all that kind of stuff yeah. than Bali, actually. Yeah. yeah. So here, yeah. we still lack sort of like that kind of thing. Although, you know, to, having said that, so Eco Bali is managing, I think, 70 bank sampah yeah, in, on the west coast of Bali. I think so, Eco, you know, Eco Bali might, is the thing that Olivier does maybe uh no that's he that's the competition that's the other company <laughs> oh oh okay, okay. Uh, olivia is based in ubud and echo bali is this lady called uh paula who has a balinese husband she's italian and yeah. they're based on the west of bali oh so kind of like uh -huh. starting from different uh-huh and what's the name Eco of bali. olivia's group that's based in ubud uh he's his is Recycling. I think it's got eco recycling or Bali recycling. They quite Bali similar. Bali recycling. Them. Bali recycling. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, so the other one's called Eco Bali. So that's the difference. Yeah. I, uh, you know, he he came here in 1995 to to like work with that group, and he walked in, yeah. and they uh, were shutting down and quitting, giving up, and they turned the whole thing over to him. <laughs> And so he oh, came here and didn't know anything <laughs> and had to figure it all out. It's a great story. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, uh, it seems to me that the, the problems are, are so severe and, and uh, species threatening, threatening to our species immediately. I mean, in the near mm -hmm. future, uh, that, that our only hope is to ha is to have a, a global response at the highest level, countries, corporations, everything, but also at the lowest levels. So there would have to be enormous amount of education and That's right. uh, just, you know, at every level. And I think we're capable of doing it, but there's not the will because the, the like you said, the commercialism, the, 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 we get drunk with, the idea of short-term profit, of, of gaining something soon. It's very, very hard for anyone to give up their lifestyle or, you know, their income. Or, it's very hard to change. So what, what, what right. do you think, like, in terms of, of attacking every level and, and having major education uh, and make it patriotic and, and religious? You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Like I so, said, you know that the, video I did yeah, it, equating yeah, uh -huh. throwing trash to being giving offerings to devils. Yeah, you're <laughs> right. So, so right. I think the religious, uh, I think the religious religious groups have a big part to play, and we've already seen now. Even in Bali, we have young. How to say? Uh, the uh, religious leader in Hindu, uh, one or two young ones are, are, are spreading that, uh, you know, how do we protect nature properly, you know, yeah. and, and how do we do that and so on. So there's a project called Pulau Plastic, which is in Indonesia. It's a series of, of films developed by uh, Kopernik, which is a, a yayasan in Ubud. Yeah. And they have how many series? Four or five. And, and that's like a film that's being shown to communities about you know, uh, what's the harm of plastic and, and so on. It, it's still, kind of, like you say, it's all just kind of like individuals and groups, you know, starting to do this. So I think that's a really encouraging sign. And obviously yeah. the government likes it and supports it. But if it's not integrated into the education system, it, it's right. tough. Also, I think in Indonesia, you need to work with the grassroots because otherwise it's, yes. it's uh, Tamil, you know. 
how to say, uh, like you say, uh, you're a guest, you're a city person, you, right. you're not us, you know. Right. That right. is a very, um, how to say, that is something that actually blocks this whole process. Right, right. And, and, that's, and, and so it's for the government and the local community, I think, is the two things. The education, all these three have to be touched together. Otherwise, the small individual efforts, they, they can't really amplify the message. You always encounter obstacles. Yes. I mean, a, a very simple example, which is kind of strange, is I uh, worked together because I started working together with Yaya Santanur. So we did a beach cleaning with, I can't remember what was that, 600 children, school children. And then we gave away uh, water bottles because we found out. Because at first they approached me to buy uh, bottled water for them. I'm like, no, I don't want to buy bottled water for them. Why don't we give them bottles? So we gave them bottles. We cleaned out the beach. And then, like, a month later, I said, hey, are they using the bottles, right? It'd be great to see them using it. Guess what? They're not using it. And why? Because there's no source of water supply in the school. Can you believe it? Yeah. No drinking water supply. So they yeah. have to buy the bottles of uh, mineral water. So why would they bring their own bottle? Stupid, right? So I'm like, oh, my God, this is just crazy, right? You think you solved the problem, but actually, no. So yeah. then the next step was to work with another yayasan to go to the school to develop how can we filter the water. So guess what? Nobody trusts the filter. This is local, yeah? They say, Gala, we want to drink mineral water. We don't trust the filter, my goodness. In Ubud, uh, in all the places they use uh, the So again, another problem. Then somebody came up with a great idea. So the idea is that uh, lay, whoever in the uh, school was selling the bottled water will now buy gallons of water, and then everybody can refill at a at a you know five thousand yeah. or some very cheap right. price. So that one worked. That is the solution we're going to implement before the corona struck. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh, so that uh -huh. see, it's got to be that kind of a local arrangement. Because from the minds of somebody like me, an environmentalist, they're like, what's the big deal? Just buy them a, you know, sterilizer or whatever, and then we're done. Actually, no, it's not. That's the problem. So the, the solutions have all got to be implemented with the community because they have different attitudes than we do. We're, you know, different situations. So yeah. what seems silly to us might be the right thing, you know? I'm like, why would they want to spend money on water? But, you know, that's what they want to do. They want the mineral water. Okay, in that case, you know. Yeah, we haven't bought water since in, in, in uh, six years. We we See? have our own yeah. filter. We have a Nazava. We have exactly. three Nazava filters. And See exactly. You, That's you the know one we Jorin, were going to get them. Do you know Jorin? Uh, I've met. I've yeah. met um, uh, the Dutch one. I can't remember her name. A long time ago. Yeah, uh, when they first started. Joran has distributed thousands of Nazava water filters around, and he's always going to different islands and telling people how to use yeah. them. Yeah. There is a problem exactly. with them, though. Now, now, we have bought five of them for people we work with, uh, and mm -hmm. no, Indonesians. And these are, right. these are Indonesians, you know, uh, local Bali people who are, you know, somewhat... They're they're used to dealing with foreigners. Well, our our Pembantu isn't, but yeah. Anyway, so I gave one to her and her husband. And her husband's a driver, so um, and and uh, we gave one to uh, Nyoman, who's a Bemo driver. We've been using for six years. Right. Both of them d didn't clean them properly, and yeah, and had to have problem. their their uh, charcoal candle replaced. Uh, you know, like <laughs> within a year or within nine months or something. Right. And I had to talk to them. You know, it was like they needed. <laughs> exactly. And these are people, these aren't like uh, country people, you know. I had to talk to exactly. them. Exactly. Like it's very simple to clean, clean it. I don't it. even use the uh, the abrasive thing. I just use my hand to clean it. And ah, it, yeah. They usually just, use that thing. Yeah, they come with the abrasive thing. Yeah. I don't use it because they don't. They last so much longer if you just use your hand and just wait till it gets slimy, and yep. it, it doesn't happen so often. And uh, but so one problem with the individual filters like that is that they're a maintenance system. Yes, uh, exactly. And 
you know, again, the, the only long-term solution I can see is that the, the government provides good drinking water to people in one way or another. Yeah. But we do use those filters. Um, yeah, exactly. That's my point. It's, it's uh, you know, but, you know, if they want to drink, uh, uh, what you call it, mineral water and pay a little bit for them out of gallons, I'm like, okay, why not? Let's do it, you know, right? Instead of trying to uh, climb uphill and trying to get them to take care of their filters, because once they don't clean it and the water starts to smell, then there's like, I don't want that. You That's know, because right. we brought up, you know, when a young age with cholera, you know, I, I still remember when cholera was a big deal in my house in the old days. Uh-huh. So I understand this, this kind of fear, you know, of smelly water and slimy water and stuff like that. You know, well, so, okay, if that's how you feel, fine, you know. <laughs> okay, it's well, then hard. At least then, <laughs> at least then they shouldn't use the really small ones because they're not recyclable. You know what I mean? No, the big gallon, the gallon one, there, there's no waste, you know. Yeah. Um, that's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, now. Uh, the gallon the tr- one's a big, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, could drink it. My wife is in Biwa. And mm-hmm. uh, are you in Biwa? No. No, all right. Uh, I I think I'd know if you were in Biwa, and uh, yeah. so she she'd be on the environmental committee, right? And there'd be all these people. Okay. There. Oh, and yeah. She no, and one here. other person would have their stainless steel water bottles, and everyone else right. would have a plastic bottle. And just right, you know, she just experienced at that level how uh, it was hard to get people beyond just a sort of feel good. Uh, cosmetic level of dealing with um, issues. But they do a lot of good things with the, with the poor sure, people I'm in, sure uh, they in, do. in the communities. Uh, wow. They've been to some places where people are really poor. The, the, mm. uh, so, um, so are you hopeful, Susie? <laughs> oh, I am, actually. Uh-huh. I think just to have a governor who would pass the strictest uh, no single-use plastic uh, regulation in the whole of Indonesia and actually won an appeal, you know, against that regulation is a big deal already. I mean, you know, if you look at Indonesia, that is a huge deal. Yeah. And, um, you know, and the fact that actually because of international people like you and having tourists means that uh, the awareness will always be there. It cannot completely go away. So it's, it's, it's just a matter of things working out in some way. It's not going to happen overnight, but, but I do feel hopeful. I do feel hopeful. The awareness is there. The people don't, haven't gotten to the stage where things kind of work um, as a framework. You know what I mean? It's just kind of like uh, sporadic things right now. Yeah. 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 Ah, wow. That is, uh, I really uh, admire uh, and appreciate everything uh, you've done and continue doing. And, um, oh, let me ask you one thing. Uh, Do you ever meet with the governor here? I don't, I don't, I'm not involved like sort of formally. I did meet him once in an airport, but I am, I'm sort of uh, informally associated with the tourism board talking about the environment, telling them, hey, guys, come on, you know, let's not talk tourism all the time. (laughs) Let's look at sustainability. But as an informal sort of uh, friend of the Bali Tourism Board, and that's most time I find out things from them. Is is there, um, you know, like in America, there are very strong environmental organizations that that lobby and push and and encourage government and elected officials. Um, That's right. Is there, uh, and, and I lived in Japan for four years, and that was a problem in Japan, is, is they didn't yeah, have strong national don't. environmental mm-hmm. organizations. They had grass, lots of grassroots ones. Uh, right. Uh, so, so we're kind of similar, yeah. I think at the national level in Jakarta, you do. Uh-huh. You do. You've got the Greenpeace, you've got Wauhi, you know, there is Wauhi here. I think the strongest organization here is actually, uh, you know, for Bali, the anti-reclamation um, group. Yeah. Yeah, that is the strongest. So what I heard from my friend is that 
the anti-reclamation movement actually united uh, all the activists in Bali. So there are uh, people who are environmentalists, people who mostly environmentalists. Uh, all the organizations, they're there. In Bali, the organizations are quite small. And in Bali, they're separated, you know, the Indonesian ones or the Bali ones. And there's the, uh, the Indonesian related to Indonesia. And then there is the foreign, mostly uh, foreigner led. So there are different groups. But the Indonesian and the local ones are all grouped under for Bali. And that's, you know, I don't know how today they're doing, but they're actually the main pressure group. Yeah. But yeah. not so much in the overall policy, but mainly about the reclamation and the fact that it is, uh, how do you say, this whole Banoa Bay is part of the identity of Bali. So well, that's me, their, um, yeah, let me ask you more about that. You're talking about the Tolak Reclamasi people, right? Yes, correct. That's right. Um, that is the, that, it, more than anything I've seen here, that is the, there was the most unified, overwhelming total opposition correct. to, uh, correct. to so-called reclaiming Benoa, Benoa Bay, would we call exactly. it? Exactly. Uh, yes. Benoa. I mean, there were giant, giant signs everywhere and Correct. all the different groups were opposed to it. Bali was united in being opposed to it. So wasn't it just happening anyway? Um, it's like, uh, how to say, they've made it quite a bit unclear, if you will. <laughs> huh. So I don't know, I have to go and check with them again, but there were news coming out, yes, no, yes, no, or who, what, what, you know. So we're not clear, honestly. After this corona hit, I think we haven't had any news, but, um, you know, if I ask one of my friends, then they would know. But it's a little bit, it's not so great. Not so great. It was a no, and then because uh, Busi signed this uh, protecting Benoa Bay as a conservation area, which means obviously cannot be reclaimed. And then her boss said that she uh, insulted the president by doing that. And then what else came out? I forgot what was the drama after that. So it's a bit unclear right now. Uh huh. You know, when Jokowi would come here, which he does periodically, they would have to cover or take down the signs, the anti reclamation signs, where, wherever he was going. <laughs> Did you know right. that? That's right. Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> I, can, I suspect that. It's very normal for Indonesia. You know, always <laughs> trying to clap and everything. It's very normal for our culture. Well, well what I see. That, and I'm not sure what's what. I'm, I'm mainly concerned about the mangroves, not destroying the mangroves. Yes, exactly. Uh, but, but I see an enormous amount of sand and uh, yes. you, you know, is, build, building the, yeah, the, the, the land out. The and port. also they burned all the fishing boats. Yeah, that one, well, you know, that is, this is Indonesia. I don't know if it was an accident or not, no idea. But the, <laughs> the reclamation that you see that you see is a uh, extension of the port. So what happened is the port authority under the minister of, I don't know, transportation or something or other, had ruled that they needed a bigger port because they needed a cruise ship or whatever. So that one's not the same reclamation that we, uh -huh. uh, that we were all thinking would happen, which was uh, building of these little islands, you know, uh -huh. like uh, Dubai. So that one is an extension of the port, which was actually written up by in law by somebody. I can't remember. I think it's Pusat. Yeah, I think it was the center. So that's why there's not been sort of huge things happening because that's part of the port authority thing. Oh, I see. I see. I'm wondered. Well, um, the the boat thing was really weird. I mean, uh, yeah, you know, it, it was supposed to be an accident, yeah. but uh, it seemed to me like there there were very old, you know fishing boats owned by poor fishermen, but gee, it was sort of weird when they sort of wanted them out of there and then just by accident they all burned down. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but No comment on that. I, have, I no, don't know no, the facts. <laughs> yeah, well, I know. It was just a strange uh, juxtaposition. Yeah. Well, um, anyway, I... I uh, like I was saying, I, I do I appreciate everything you're doing and continue to do. And I'm a fan. I love following you on Instagram, Sustainable Susie. <laughs> Your you. website Thank is you. sustainablesusie.com. 
And yeah. your business is the Body Shop Indonesia. Um, That's right. I'm I'm not a good customer for that. <laughs> but That's fine. I appreciate I appreciate and and I'm happy for my wife to go there every once in a while. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I thank you very very much, and um, maybe, you know, after some time after all this, yes. Yeah. <laughs> after half a year or something, we could uh, reconnect. Um, yes, yes, it'd be good to meet up, uh, maybe Bati Jimbar when this is all over. <laughs> oh, it's well, not gonna be over, right? When it opens up, yeah. I lo- yeah. Uh, that you know, we, we eat at home mainly. We were, my wife's stuck in America. She hadn't been here for three oh. months, and she won't. Oh my. Okay. She, she's hoping to get back in July, but um, right. I mainly eat here, uh, and mm-hmm. uh, but we love going to Batu Jimbar on Sunday, which is the busiest, the busiest uh, yeah. <laughs> place to go eat, <laughs> and it's mainly locals too, yeah, from all over, right. yeah. from all over. That's right, from all over. Yeah. Uh, and and the food comes from right here in Don Oposo, from the little, um, what is it called? Uh, it's just from a little Indonesian food place, you know, the, the ones that set up the tables there? Um, Dapur Sanur. Oh, Dapur Sanur, yes, yes, I know. Yeah. That is still related. There's like a relative of the people who own the uh, Batu Jimbar, a distant relative. Yeah. Oh, that makes sense. And I get the the yellow rice special, nasi kuning special. And, yeah, uh, that's good. Oh man, I, and my and and Katrinka and I get one, and split it. <laughs> yeah. And it's great. And and you know, Bobby yeah. Jimbar is a pretty expensive restaurant, but going there on Sunday that's and right. getting that, <laughs> and then our drinks, I, we'll get I'll get tea and she'll get coffee. They'll be half the cost of the whole lunch. <laughs> We were disconnected then, and we just sent some uh, WhatsApp messages back and forth saying, hey, that was cool, Uh, see you later. And yeah, thanks a lot, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Susie. Uh, Keep up the good work. Here's a song called Offerings. It's in uh, English and Indonesian. Uh, The the Indonesian title is Persimbahan Persimbahan. And uh, you remember in, in uh, when I was talking to Susie, I said that, uh, yeah, throwing plastic trash in the ocean or in the streams or whatever, it's making offerings to devils. Uh, that's the point this song makes. But it also juxtaposes that with the constant offerings they're making to the uh, spirits here. The Chenang Sari, the palm leaf offering, uh, is, um, that's one of the words for it, one of the names of it. It's about a five inch square woven palm leaf offering, and it'll have, you know, leaves and uh, flowers and all different things in it, you know, uh, as an offering. It'll even have a cigarette, maybe a little money. Uh, but they're everywhere. They are everywhere in front of every house. Well, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of Christians and Muslims that don't have them, but I think there's some that do because it's sort of a cultural thing here. Uh, and um, that, that, that every car will have one. Uh, the the um, every stall in a in a market will have one. And and sometimes. Um, the home will have a number of them in front. They'll be piled there. If you go to a temple during a ceremony, uh, uh, the, the altar will have, 
you know, a hundred of them just piled on each other there. It's not all neat and clean. <laughs> and it, it, it uh, comprises a great deal of, of the uh, organic waste here, I'll tell you. And uh, women are always making them. You know, uh, our housekeeper, Kadek, used to make them get up real early in the morning and, and make them. She'd go to the market and make them, and she'd sell them. I think she made about a penny each uh, for them. Uh, anyway, uh, really, the way to appreciate this song is to see the video, which is on YouTube, at, not at Duke, uh, and not at YouTube Duke Audio, but at David Rich Chadwick uh, un under my the songs uh, playlist. Uh, David Rich, R-E-I-C-H, Chadwick Arts, at my music site, and you could read the words there, diffusermusic.com, D-E-F-U-S-E-R, music.com. Then when you get to the home page, just hit song pages, and uh, then click on offerings, and you'll see a page for it there. And then you can you can download the video or go to the YouTube video from there. Or read the words and chords. I think I recorded this with my uh, iPhone earplugs because I was, I just wanted to get it down, you know. Uh, I, I, when I write a song, sometimes I just want to I want to record it because I don't necessarily remember them very well. Uh, so um, I just recorded it real quick with my iPhone earplugs, and um, but it sounds all right to me, so I just left it that way. So, here we go, offerings. Ada gumitir di la chenang sari. Ada satu gumitir di la chenang sari. Ada bunga gumitir di la chenang sari. Ada satu bunga gumitir di la chenang sari. Itu persimpahan kepada robagus yang menjaga bumi sehat. Itu persimpahan kepada dewa dewi yang bawa kami cinta damai. Ada sampah plastik di bawang seberanggan Ada sampah plastik di tanah Ada sampah plastik di kiri di laut Ada sampah plastik di mana-mana Ada sampah plastik terkecil di luar itu di lam Ombak dan es Di lam ikan, di lam hewan Di lam anak manusia Yang membuat bumi penyakit Itu persembahan kepada Devil, devil yang bawa kami kehancuran There's a marigold in the palm leaf offering. A single marigold in the palm leaf offering. There's a flower, a marigold in the palm leaf offering. There's a single flower marigold 
in the palm leaf offering. It is an offering to the gods and goddesses, reflecting love and peace most dear. It is an offering to the gentle spirits that strengthen the whole of this sphere. There's plastic trash thrown just anywhere. There's plastic trash on the ground. Trash in the stream, trash in the sea. There's plastic trash all around. There are tiny particles, minuscule outside and inside the waves and the ice. They're inside the fish, they're inside the fauna, they're in the children of this paradise. It is an offering to the evil spirits which drag us toward earthly ruin. The demons and devils devoted to our undoing. Adagumi tir dilam chanang sari. Adasatu gumi tir dilam chanang sari. There's a miracle in the palm leaf offering. Ada satu bunga gumi tir dilam chenang sari. This has been another episode of Life in Bali, a sidebar for <laughs> Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives. I'm DC, the Puba of Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives uh, with Doggett Bandita and Feline Cuchita here in Sonor. Here in sleepy Sonur, but without dear lovely Katrinka, who might be able to get back in mid July, wishing you and yours and all of us a grand awakening. <laughs>